I think that mathematics sort of nerdiness sort of appealed to me. And um, yeah, I, I always liked the area. I've never sort of actually worked in that area, but um, it certainly was an interesting area. I've gotten a lot of that by now, um, but I would certainly be interested in, in the um, uh, talk today about past, present, and future of, of control. Um, so I thank Carl for taking the time out to, to speak to us today. Um, I'd also like to mention Wilma and, and Rob Pierce, obviously, um, uh, for uh, you know, giving us some of your time uh, while you're up here um, to, to, uh, to talk to us today. So I, I won't read your whole, whole bio. Um, I'll be here for an hour. I think I went through the, all of that. Um, and I think without any further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Well, thank you very much indeed for inviting me here to talk about control, my favorite subject. So uh, this is a broad overview of control, and I call it automatic control a perspective. And uh, there's something. I, I think I do it like this. Uh, if you would like to know more about this, there's a paper written by myself and Kumar of Illinois, and it's called Controller Perspective, and it's in Automatica uh, 20, uh, 2014, about five years ago. And this field has, oh, perfect. Oh, oh, uh, it has several, I will essentially follow this one. Tasting the magic of feedback. I'll tell you how the field emerges. I spoke about the golden age. I talk about widening the horizon. And then I will, will not talk about this. That's included in the paper, but I will skip this. Uh, there's some material. Uh, this is a book I've written with Richard Marriott Caltech. It's called Feedback System, an introduction for scientists and engineers. The nice thing about it is that you can pick this up for free at this web page here. Here's a picture that gives you a broad, broad, broad overview. Here you have time, and here are publications in logarithmic scale. And then you see that control was chugging along here. And then in the period of 1945 to 1950, something was happening. And then it was chugging along again, and then in this period, something else was happening. So you can say, this was really where the field emerged. And this was you know, shortly after the war. There was a consequence of the war, and here's what, what I call the golden age. And then it's chugging along over there. So there are two interesting periods there. Here's a broad picture. There are examples from control from ancient times. But control really emerged in a, a connection with the developing industries. You know, steam, uh, electric power, factories, ships, aircrafts, telecommunications. And control was sometimes an enabling technology. And otherwise, it was just a, a, a toolbox. And it became a separate engineering discipline in the 40s. And it grew very rapidly. I sometimes call it the hidden technology, because it's widely used, very successful, and you seldom talk about it, except when there is a disaster. And I have an illustration of this here. This is from Swedish television. Uh, it's a story about pilots. You can see there's a plane coming in here. And it oscillates a little bit, and oscillates a little bit more. And then something happens. The pilot only broke an arm. But when this happens, people are really talking about control. And nowadays, you know, there's a lot of talk about the, the Boeing airplane, which was having some very serious accidents. Uh, so uh, why? What does this happen? Well, I think it's much easier to talk about hardware than to talk about ideas, which essentially control. And also, we have not done a very good job of um, uh, emphasizing what control is to our colleagues in the other fields and also to the general public. There's a little exception from that. There's a book written by Pierre Albertus in Spain and even Marels here in Australia. It's called Feedback and Control for Everyone. So that's an attempt to uh, describe control for a very broad audience. So that was a little bit of introduction. Now I'll talk about the magic of feedback. And I tell my students that I will call you up in the middle of the night and you must remember this. Uh, I call it the magic of feedback. You can reduce variations due to disturbances. You can make good system for bad components. You can follow command signals, and you can stabilize the shape behavior of the system. 
fantastically good properties. And Arthur C. Clarke has said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable for magic. And that's typically for control. There are two drawbacks. Whenever you close a feedback loop, you can always run into instability. Um, so therefore, stability theory has been a very important field to study and control because you must understand your drawbacks. The other thing which is not so much spoken about is that whenever you are closing a feedback loop, you are feeding measurement noise into the system. So we must make sure that whatever noise we feed in is not too large. And then here are some typical applications, for example, in power generations. When power came about, you wanted to make machines to rotate with a constant velocity to make, you know, 50 hertz or, or, or 60 hertz. And the so solution of this was the governor and turbine controllers. The side effect was stability theory. And uh, James Watt, Maxwell, Ralph, Stodol, and Hurwitz. So here you have them. You have James Watt. You had, um, uh, let's see if I can get them right now. Uh, this is, does anybody know who Maxwell is? I think this is Maxwell and this is Routh. And I know that uh, this is Stodol and Horowitz. And then you have Vishnegradsky in uh, Russia and you have uh, Lyapunov. And one of the first books of control was written by an engineer called Tollev. It's a textbook in control for 1905. It was essentially based on uh, the power industry. Another field, process control. You want to keep temperature, pressure, and concentration constant, and the solution was the PID controller. They had some nice side effects. One, we got standardized industrial systems, and we got standardized communication in the form of a plastic tube with given dimensions, and then pressure 3 to 15 PSI. And since you standardized communication, you could have standardized sensors, standardized controllers, and standardized actuators. Uh, and also, you had to do something with the PID controller, so we got the Siegler-Nichols tuning rules. Uh, there, is, there is Nichols and there is Siegler. And uh, in connection with PI control, we have another amazing property. I call it the amazing property of integral action. Whenever you have a controller which has integral action, if you connect it to any process and you get an equilibrium, so that this is the control signal and this is the error. So that control signal and the error goes to a constant. Then you see that this is a constant, this is a constant, and this is a constant. This means that the, the integral has to converge. It means that the error has to go to zero. So whenever you have a controller with integral action and you connect it to anything, uh, if, it's, if it stabilizes, it will always give you zero error. And some people say that um, uh, the controller adapts to changing disturbances. Then we move over to, over to flight control. And you know, at the beginning of the previous century, many people tried to fly. And the, only pe the first people who succeeded were the Wright brothers. And most people, they made stable aeroplanes. They got them up in the air, and then they fell down stably. What the Wright brothers did, they focused on maneuverability. So they made an aeroplane that was unstable and stabilized this with, with um, uh, manual control. So they had a pilot to stabilize the aircraft. And the, it's, of course, pretty boring to sit there and stabilize an aircraft. So very quickly, the right flew 1905, and very quickly you got an autopilot that was stabilizing an aeroplane. So here are the Wright brothers, and here we have Sperry, who made the first autopilot. And here is one of the first autopilot flights. Uh, it's from France in Le Boucher, and here you have Sperry's son. I don't just see that, but stretching out sand. Look, no hands. And then you have the pilot here walking uh, back and forth along the wing to introduce perturbations. Uh, there's a very nice quote about what Wilbur Wright, before he flew, four years before he flew, he said like this, we know how to construct an aeroplane, we know how to build engines. Inability to balance and steer still confronts the, the students of the flying problem. When this one feature has been worked out, the age of flying will have arrived because all other difficulties are of minor importance. And the Wright brothers, they were, uh, they were making bicycles in the Midwest in the US. Uh, so they realized very clearly, you know, the, the, the compromise between maneuverability and stability. Now, if you look to modern aircrafts, um, so the Wright brothers made an unstable but maneuvered aircraft. Uh, if you take a modern aircraft, if you take an aircraft, here's the center of mass and here's the center of pressure. Because of aerodynamics, when you go supersonic, the center of pressure is moving far down here. 
And then you see the plane becomes really rock stable. And then to turn the plane, you need to have a lot of area and a lot of mass down here. So then it becomes very tempting to do it like this. Redesign the aeroplane so that here is the center of pressure in, in, in normal operation when you go supersonic moves over here. Because then the arm here, the longest arm here will be much shorter. In here, you know, the longest arm will be pretty long. And then it means that you can have less material up here and you can really gain performance. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means in this case, the aeroplane is unstable. What flight condition does it correspond to? Well, that's takeoff and landing. So you're making aeroplanes that's unstable in takeoff and landing, but you're gaining fantastic performance. This is, of course, irresistible to the military. So this is a plane that um, many, the modern fighters are all built like this. And this happens to be a Swedish plane. And um, if you go back and said, you look at ships, one of the people who was working on ships said, it's an old adage that a stable ship is difficult to steer. The same old compromise. Here's another quote on, on the right. Draper is, you know, one of the leading professors at MIT. And uh, the US Academy of Engineering, they have a Draper Medal. That's one of their finest awards that's named after him. And they said that the Wright brothers reacted to the principle that an aircraft should be inherently stable and that the human flight would only have to steer the vehicle, playing no part in stabilization. Instead, they deliberately made the aeroplane with negative stability and depend on the human to operate the movable surface and stabilize the plane. Well, nature was way, way ahead of us. This is an article written in the paper called Evolution. And it says, birds, advantages of instability. The earliest bird and flying insect were stable. This is believed to be because in the absence of a highly evolved sensory nervous system, they would have been unable to fly if they were not stable. But there are tremendous advantages to be unstable, both if you are, uh, if you are a predator and if you are a prey, you can avoid much quicker. So the animals quickly found out that it was a tremendous advantage to, um, to be unstable. And then as the animals developed, they got better sensory organs and better brains, they actually became unstable. So all, all birds are unstable. Then we move to a different field, telecommunications. And uh, when telecommunications grew, you needed to communicate between longer and longer distances. And they needed to amplify the electronic signals. You know, you had the wires, and then you needed to have an amplifier. And if you have a long, long line across the United States, you need to have many amplifiers. So you needed to make an amplifier that was very stable and was very linear, because when you put many amplifiers after each other, you can get a lot of distortion. And then at Bell Labs, uh, uh, there was a man named Black who invented the feedback amplifier. So here's an amplifier with very high gain. And then you, have, you f take the output, feed it back in here. And if you analyze this, you find that the ratio between this voltage and this voltage is given by this equation. Notice in here, K is the gain of the amplifier, and R1 and R2 are these resistances. And look here, if K is very large, then this term here dominates. And the gain is simply, then you can knock out the K, and the gain is simply R2 over R1. So in other words, if you have a very high gain amplifier, the gain is only determined by these passive components. So what they had to amplify at that time was an electronic tube, which was a very bad device. It was nonlinear, and it had varying characteristics. But by introducing feedback, they could get tremendous advantage of this. As I said in the beginning, when you close the feedback loop, you run into instability. For amplifier, this was called singing. The amplifier started to sing. So you had to figure out, you know, what were the stability conditions. And then you had two giants, Harry Nyquist, who was born in Sweden. And then you had Henrik Bode, who was born in the United States. Uh, they worked out stability theory and uh, many other things around the, uh, the, f the feedback amplifier. Um, this paper came out around 1930-something. Here's a quote from ASEA. It's a Swedish company that's now called ABB, ASEA Brambovieri. And when I became professor in Lund, I invited industrial people to come in a lecture. And this is a verb time quote from one of the, from the leading control guy at ASEA. And he said, around 1950, what they did was that they linearized the equation, they solved the characteristic equation. 
We also mentioned that solving the characteristic equation with a mechanical calculator was itself an ordeal. So you, you do a control system, you find the, the roots are in the wrong half plane, and then you question, what should you do? And they had no idea until they got the Nyquist results. Because then they knew that you have to bend the Nyquist curve a little bit so you're avoiding the critical point. So to them it was a revolution when they got hold of Nyquist theorem. So that was a little bit about the magic of feedback. So feedback is irresistible because you have all these nice properties. So it's, it started to become used and it became used in very, very many fields. So then how did the field of control emerge? You know, control was in uh, aeronautics, in uh, process control, in uh, uh, e electricity, etc. So the scene of around 1940, control was widespread use in many fields. Power generation and distribution, process control, autopilots, missile guidance and control, telecommunications. And people in the different fields did not recognize they were doing the same thing because the fields were isolated. So what did it do to, to take a discipline? Well, the driver was the war effort. So what happened is that in many countries people realized that science could be a fantastic impact on the war effort. So what did they do? where they gathered laboratories where they brought in people from all sorts of things uh, in all countries, even in a country like Sweden and in England and uh, particularly in the United States, for example, around MIT they set up a huge collection of, la of, of laboratories. And then they got people coming from process control, coming from telecommunications, coming from aeronautics, and they were put to solve world problems. And then they discovered, we've been doing the same things. Uh, so then, uh, the, because of the war effort, the field emerged and the concepts were feedback and feed forward. The design tools were block diagrams and transfer functions. You simulate the system with analog computing. You implement the system with analog computers. And you have what I call a holistic view of theory and applications. The same group were doing everything. They were doing the analysis, the, the theory, they were doing the simulation, they were implementing the control system. So you had a very tight connection between all the aspects of this. And this happened then around the military labs. And here are just the quick things. Here is, for example, the Germans, they made a cruise missile, V1. They made a ballistic missile. And they had a whole collection of ideas for other missiles. Some of them were bu built, uh, some of them were not built. We got something called server mechanism theory, uh, where number one, you describe the system first by a block diagram. This is taken from a German book uh, from 1945. Opened. Uh, so what you do is that you hide the system by putting a cloth around it. You only ask, what is the effect of this input on that output? Um, so this is what is now called by computer science the information hiding. Uh, so you can view systems now as blocks. You draw blocks and you have a block diagram. So the theory was complex various Laplace transforms. System constant were feedback and feed forward. The design was frequency response and graphical methods. And here is a uh, hardware-in-the-loop simulator from Saab aircraft from the 1950s. So here's an analog computer, and they have the airplane here with all the regular servers and things like this. Then you simulate the rest in the computer, and you try it out. And here's an old analog computer. This is one of the first books that came out. It's um, 1942. It's called Server Mechanism Theory. It's written by James, Nichols, and Phillips, and it came out of the Radiation Laboratory series. Radiation Laboratory was a lab around MIT. And they, they afterwards, they put a whole series of books, and this control book is number 25. There were many about radar. And what they did was after the war, they allowed people to sit there and work and document what they have been doing, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and interesting here, here is that James, he was a physicist. Nichols, he worked for an instrumentation company. And Phillips was the first-rate mathematician. So control from its birth was multidisciplinary, you know. Uh, physics, mathematics, and control. The consequences were tremendous. Number one, you get education. So people then discovered that it was not only the military, but also the civil people who could have great use for control. So uh, I, I used to say that control spread like wildfire all over the world. So you got in engineering, you got educational control, sometimes in aeronautics, sometimes in mechanical engineering, sometimes in uh, uh, electrical engineering. 
Uh, for example, in Sweden, we have always had the tradition of to have separate departments of control, similar to you do mathematics, because we realized very early that it cuts across all the boundaries. Uh, we got application, so one found out that uh, control could be used way outside the military field. We got industrialization, you got you know, companies that specialized in control. Foxborough, Bailey, etc., Fisher. We get organizations. One of the most important one is International Federation of Automatic Control. Um, what happened was that um, uh, after the war uh, in Germany, one was going to, to do some conference in control, so they gathered a lot of people around. And they said, oh, this is so wide, so we really have to get together. And then they formed uh, IFAC, International Federation of Automatic Control. I think it was around 1956. And they invited all the international people to collaborate. And then they decided to have every third year is going to be a world conference. The first one was in Moscow. And a couple of years ago, it was here in Sydney. And then they had different groups for different specialization fields that have you know, regular conferences and things. We got journals and we got conferences in here. So uh, that's when the field was formed. And then I'm going to talk about what I call the golden age. And I think any field could be pretty satisfied with the way control looked like around 1960. You know, you had established a field, you had an international organization, you had conferences, and people get together and talk. But in control, there was something else that happened that led to what I call the golden age. The drivers was the space race. And, you know, in Sweden right now, we have had a lot of TV programs about the Apollo program. You know, right after the war, the Russians were way ahead of the Americans. They sent out satellites, they were going around and beeping. And they sent up uh, a dog. They sent up a man, Gagari. And the Americans had not sent up anything. And then Kennedy stood up and said, before the end of the century, we're going to put a man on the moon, we're going to get him back alive. And that generated a fantastic amount of research and also research money to organization and universities, and also in, mother, in other cases of the world. Um, another thing that happened was computer control. Uh, people discovered that you can use digital computers for control. I was very fortunate. I was hired by IBM in 1960, and I worked for them for five years. And IBM at that time was the leading computer company in the world. And they believed that you could make a lot of money by putting computers into control. They actually set up a control group out of the mathematics research department in Yorktown Heights. They hired Kalman to run the group. He wasn't there for very long, but he started that. And then they tried to do experiments by putting computers onto various inst industries. They had some total failures in the pulp and paper industry and in the steel industry in the US. So then they said, let's try in Europe. So they started the this chain of laboratories in Europe, one is in Stockholm with a mission of um, look at applications to, to pulp and paper industry and to the steel industry. So I was lucky enough to be drawn into that. Uh, so uh, the drivers were the space race, computer control, and also mathematics. Because one discovered pretty quickly that the mathematics we've been using was not enough. Uh, as a result of this, there was a rapid growth of subspecialities. We got optimal control, stochastic control, nonlinear control. So what has happened then, that you became specializations in control. And also, there was so mon much money around. So you could just focus on one specialization and forget about the rest. So that's why I'm saying that, and also we had computational tools. And there was a fantastic development of theory, because there were some stellar scientists coming in that earlier. But, but we lost the holistic view. So you had people who were extremely good about um, optimal control, but they couldn't tune a PI controller. You had somebody who was extremely good in stochastic, noisy control, but they didn't know anything about nonlinear control and any other things. So you got a fragmentation. And in particular in the US, you know, you get your PhD, and then you get hired by a university. It takes three years to get a PhD there. So what do you do? Well, you have to prove that you can teach. You have to do have the research. You have to get in money. So what do you do? Well, you take some old problems for your PhD thesis, and then put three students to do a PhD on that. And then after three years, they came out in the same. Well, this has happened you know, three or four times. It gets pretty watered out. The problems get pretty uninterested. But you could still do it because there was so much money around, because of the space race. 
So we lost the holistic view. Then some of the great people, Richard Bellman, fantastic mathematician, he invented dynamic programming. Pontryagin, he uh, did opt optimal control theory. They were, uh, in particular Pontryagin, he was inspired by the space race. How do you shoot up a rocket to get up a heavy rocket as quickly as possible? And he figured out how to do this, and he and his colleague got the Lenin Prize for that. Uh, there were also many others that I will mention, but uh, these are certainly two. Another thing, uh, you know, we, uh, I mentioned in here that uh, whenever you close a feedback loop, you are feeding measurement noise into the system. So you have to make sure that the measurement noise don't hurt you too much. And uh, there were two people who were influenced. One was Norbert Wiener, and he also founded the word cybernetics, you know, control in animals and machines. Uh, but he did a very nice filtering theory. And then we had Kalman, who did the Kalman filter. And Kalman did two things. And what the Kalman filter is, it's a very nice way to combine sensors and a mathematical model to get that information you cannot measure directly. So it's a you can say it's a theory for indirect measurements. Kalman also did another thing. He came up with a new controller structure. And he said that the co controller should look like this. Here's the process. And then you connect the Kalman filter here. The Kalman filter sees all the signals you send into the process. It sees how the process reacts. And inside it has a mathematical model. And it calculates the best state estimate of the state it can get. And then you have here a device that we call the feed forward signal rate. So when you're sending command signals, you generate the desired behavior of the state. And you also, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. And then you compare the, the desired behavior of the state with the actual behavior, and then you have a state feedback. And then you have another term in here. And if you're going to move the process around, you figure out, how should I change the input of the process to make the process behave the way I want? So you're sending this signal in here. And if everything is perfect, then this signal here, they agree, and feedback doesn't do anything. But there are some modeling errors and other things. Then feedback comes in and helps you. So Kalman gave us a very nice controller structure, with, which we call a state feedback and a Kalman filter. And there's also a feed-forward signal rate generator that's important. Um, for control, you also need to do models. And um, this was something I was, uh, myself was concerned with. Uh, we walked around in the paper factory and tried to see, make mathematical models of this. And your paper is something like this. You take a tree, you chop it up into woods, and then you either grind the woods or put it into chemicals so you get, uh, release the fibers. And then you take the fibers and then you put them out on uh, uh, a wire. It's uh, 10 meters wide. And then it's a steel web that goes like this. And then the, you, you drain the water out of this. And then you see it through heating cylinders. You get paper coming out in the other end. So we tried to model this by first principles. And um, it was tremendously difficult and complicated. So we said we have to, and uh, time consumed, so we have to do it in another way. So then we started with system identification. What is that? Well, we change the flow going into the machine like this systematically, and then we measure the thickness of the paper that's coming out. And then we apply mathematics to calculate on these two signals to derive a mathematical model. And that's when, once we have done this, we can do control. So here's a typical example. This is the final result of control, and this is the control actions in the same scale. So without control, it will roughly be more or less the sum of these two signals. But with control, we can take away this one. And we do it by doing mathematical modeling. And I did this together with one of my friends, Torsten Bolin. And um, uh, the control strategies are developed in the paper. So this was done in 1965. And this paper came out in 67. You know, this is a very tedious procedure. You know, you have to go out there, you have to plan the experiment, you have to talk. And to do experiments on a process is not easy. For example, the paper, the paper, pulp and paper, they were extremely reluctant to let us do this. Uh, because they thought we would destroy production. So then we said, let's do an experiment. Why don't you put your quality control people and test what you are doing? And then we'll do some simple tests. We did some simple tests. They didn't know when we were putting in perturbations or not, so they let us continue. It really helps to have a good relation to the operators when you do this. So um, uh, 
uh, after a while we were able to, but the time consuming procedure, so we thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could have a magic controller that could both figure out what the model is and do the control. So we started to work on adaptive control. And we developed something called the self-tuning regulator. Um, ABB had a group uh, working in the research department that uh, took over this and did it quite successfully. But it never flew because the device was a bit too complicated. One of the important things is that you have to pick the sampling rate. And the sampling rate is fairly critical when you do it. And this is you know, not the normal control system. I still don't understand why it really didn't take off. This group grew quickly up to about 50 people, and they were quite profitable. But then they tried to transfer this to the regular operations department. They couldn't do this. Another side effect we did, you know, here's a map of Europe. Here is Lund. Uh, we had um, um, a student who was moved up to Kirina to a uh, iron ore factory, and they had an ore grinder. And an ore grinder is a pretty horrible machine. And they wanted to imp do improved control of that. So, oh, let's try an adaptive controller, we said. So we set up a telecommunication from Lund up to Kirina. It's about 2,000 ki 2, kilometers network control. In 1975, done with a couple of our students. Sample rate 20 seconds. We had telephones to supervise what's happening. And it was doing quite well. Uh, so uh, adaptive control never took off, except for a few areas. We had a local shipyard near, near Lund in Malmö. And uh, together with them, we developed adaptive autopilots. And um, it was a nice PhD project, because the student was flying to Kuwait. And then he was putting his algorithms on the boat, running one hour with the adaptive, running one hour with the regular, and shifting like this. So we got under reasonably comparable operation where we could compare things. So here is the performance with an ordinary PID, and here's performance with an adaptive controller under similar conditions. So you see here is the heading deviation, and here's what the rudder looks like, and here's with the adaptive. And you see there's a significant better performance in here. And if you look to this, the, the magnitude of the control signals here are about the same as here, but there's a little bit more high frequency. Uh, and if you evaluate what this is, you save 3% of fuel, which is a noticeable effect. This was, they made a product called um, Steermaster, and then this, then this was sold to Sperry Marine, and now it's, uh, so it's taken over by Northrop Grumman. So this is an autopilot that we did that is um, still in operation. Uh, the paper was published in 79, but it's one of the success stories of adaptive control. Then I should mention another field called robust control. And uh, uh, this has to do with the loss of the holistic view. So you had the classical control guys, they were standing over here, and they were saying, you know, we have trouble when you have time delays. We know that time delays are creating troubles. Zeros in the half plane, in the right half plane, and poles in the half plane are creating troubles. And then you had the guys who knew Kalman filter and state field, they were standing, oh, I don't think that's any trouble at all, because as long as you have controllability and observability, I can design an optimal controller. And the guy over here said, well, no, I, I don't understand all this mathematics, but I know that time delays are difficult, so why doesn't it come into your picture? And this guy said, oh, well, you know, you have to learn some more mathematics, you know, before you do it. So there you had this sort of confrontation. Instead of sitting down and having a civilized discussion, it, it became confrontational. And then, of course, after a while, <laughs> truth will always come out. And um, it became pretty clear that time delays are difficult, and right type plane poles are difficult. And there are some really fundamental limitations there. And the people who developed this was uh, George Sames in Canada, John Doyle, a somewhat abrasive young man in the States, uh, uh, Bruce Francis in Canada, uh, Keith Glover in England, and Pramod Kargonaker. So they wrote a paper where they finally figured out that, well, the old things about time delays and things are important. If you look at applications, um, the traditional field, power system, process control, aerospace, automotive, buildings, and robotics, uh, they were certainly developed, but then were the new fields come in. Control of computer systems, you know, the, uh, the web servers, you know, the server farms, and also to move control up to the business level. 
Uh, control has been applied to advertisements. It's used in mobile telephones. It's used in art and games. And it's popping up in, in um, physics and biology. Automotive is one of the big drivers right now. And the reason is that um, you make so many cars. So they have a lot of economic muscle. So what happened was that um, uh, the car industry was forced to satisfy the California emission standards. And the only way they could do they couldn't do this by hardware. The only way they could do this by feedback. So introduce a lambda sensor which is measuring the dot that's coming out and they arrange the feedback. And to do the feedback they needed to have a computer. They, need, they, they didn't want to do it with an analog device. So they essentially forced Intel and um, Motorola to make the microcontroller, to make you know, a small computer with input and output. Uh, later on, they also uh, forced them to do sensors. Um, they also formed other alliances. For example, they are th one of the strong drivers for uh, a new modeling language for a modeling physical system called Modelica. So you use this in powertrains. You have, you have cruise control and you have adaptive cr cruise control. There's a company in Lund, for example, that has a little rad uh, radar chip that you can measure the distance to the car in front of you. And then you can call, control the distance to the car in front of you. You have traction control, you have lane guidance control. And incidentally, traction control was first invented by the, aer by the, um, uh, the aerospace industry. Citroën in France had an aer airplane factory. And in the beginning of the century, they made the, f the first uh, traction control when the airplane is landing, for example. Um, and then you have uh, lane guidance control, you have platooning and autonomous driving. So automotive is a strong one. But I'll tell you about another field that is close to my heart, and that's what we call relay auto tuning. You know, the PID controller is a very useful device. And um, I happened by accident to. The story was the following this was in, uh, in the 70s. Uh, most of my students they have gone into large companies. ASEA, Volvo, etc. But then they started to go into small companies. And that knew very, I knew very little. I, I had been on the advisory board for Ericsson and ABB. So I knew quite a lot about large companies. I knew nothing about small companies. I said, I should really, being a good professor, I should know something about small companies. And there was a golden opportunity because the Swedish state wanted to have development done in small companies. So they all, you got a fantastic deal. I kept my job at the university. I worked at the company for half a year. And the company paid half my salary to the government and the rest. And I was actually really doing some special things. But in connection with this, this was a small company. They had about uh, 50, 70 people, five engineers. And they were typically taking equipment from England and putting them together and then develop, developing systems for the milk packaging industry. And they had a very far-sighted manager there. And they said, uh, you should go to... Manchester and meet Mike Sommerfeld. Mike Sommerfeld was the guy who started um, a company called Eurotherm. And they were one of the companies that made the first really good analog temperature controllers. So I came there and um, he convinced me that the PID controller was a very useful thing. There were many things we didn't know about the universities that we should introduce, like wind up and uh, gain scheduling and many other things. And also, he said that there's a big problem in tuning PID controllers. And he said what they were doing, they had a batch of, I think they had 12 processes or something like this, that they were testing controllers on. So I came back to university, and then I had a PGT student, Tore Heglund, and we said we should try to find a smart way to tune PID controllers. We started thinking about this, and we came up with the, what we call the relay auto tuner, which we patented. Uh, and how does it work? Well, here you have the regular control loop. Normally, they will sit there. To tune it, you switch in a relay here instead. What happens when you switch in a relay? Well, you build up an oscillation like this. And if you look to the input, this, so here's the input, and here's the output. So the input and output, if you approximate this by sine wave, input and output, they are uh, out of phase, 180 degree out. So you're determining the point, point where the process has 180 degree phase shift. You can do it in a fairly safe way because you can limit the amplitude you have here. 
Uh, and then we determine the period. And then we were using simple rules to find the PID parameters. Uh, so um, we developed this one, and um, uh, the, uh, the paper came out in 1984. And it's robust and fairly easy to use. And you can do, uh, if you do single loop control, just push a button and tune it. We can also use it to automatically generate gain schedules. But there are many versions. You can use it in standalone control. You can use it in DCS. You can use it in a PLC. And there are hundreds and thousands of these controllers out there. And that's very useful industrial experience. We also had the deal with the company that we should be allowed to publish. So we have written three books on PRD control. This is the first one. And this one here is the last one. And there is one, one intermediate book sitting there. Here's a cool example. Um, one of the things we did was a small uh, DCS system, a small, a small uh, PLC. Uh, and this was put up in a factory in northern Sweden, and they had about uh, 40 loops. And normally to tune this loop, is a week's operation. So we went up there, you tune the first loop, tune the second loop, we did it in two days, so we were delighted. And then the people are coming to us. We have this nasty process in here. Can't you help us to tune that? And you know, I have gray hair, so when you get a question like this, you said no. Because the reason is that it's probably not the tuning of the controller that makes it not work, and many, many other things. But we were younger then, and, and we were happy, said we tried it. Uh, so this is one of the strip recorders that was the recording we had. The so time is running in this direction. So around midnight, we connect the recorder and we see what's happening. You see, the loop is oscillating. And then at 11.30, we put the control into manual. At 2 o'clock, we push the tuning button here. And then what's happening in here, in here, the, the tuner is actually measuring the noise level and determining. We have a little bit of hysteresis. In here, you determine the hysteresis. And then in here, it does the relay tuning. You see, it's not really good sine waves. So, you know, one, two. Three, four. So we were waiting here, you know, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock. Is it really going to work? At eight o'clock, it goes automatic by itself. Now it has figured out enough, and it controls. And look to what it's doing. And what it did, it reduced gain from eight to one point three. It increased integration time from 2000 to 43, and it introduced a healthy amount of derivative action. So uh, I'm a great fan of um, really auto tuners. So here's a list of industrial products. Uh, you can have automatic tuning. We can also do other things. You can do gain scheduling, because very often, you know, tuning depends on where you operate. So you find the scheduling variable, and then split it up into a couple of regions. And then you operate in one region, push the tuning button, operate in another region, push the tuning button, operate in the third, push the tuning button, and then you have some kind of smoothing between. So that's what we call the gain scheduling. We also have adaptive feed forward and adaptive feedback. The reason we have that is that when we persuaded the company to develop this controller, they had about 200 people sitting in Stockholm in, the, in, in that division. We knew that, and they had the real engineering department who were, so to say, thinking people were about seven. And we knew that they had so much to do, so they would never be able to develop this up in that environment. So we persuaded them to set up a small group in the Science Park in Lund. They hired Tore Heglund, and they hired another of my PhD students. They took one of the senior guys from Stockholm and put them there for a limited period of, say, a couple of years. And then we knew we had the chance, so we did also adaptive feedback and adaptive feed forward. So we could also adapt the game continuous. That is not, that's not being used so much. And this was the first controller we did in 84. It had, uh, it was a DCS system where automatic tuning and gain scheduling. This was a system where I had showed you the picture of before. This is a single loop controller. And now it's a different company because this was bought up by another company. And then this other company also did a much simpler this also had automatic tuning and gain scheduling. This one only had automatic tuning. And then this was brought up by another Swedish company, Alfa Laval Automation, and they had several DCS. And then it was brought up by another company called Sat Control, uh, who did this. And then in the contract we had with them, they should also sell patents. They sell licenses to other people. They didn't do this. But then I was on sabbatical at University of Texas in Austin. 
And in Austin, there is a company called Fisher Controls. And they were the best valve company in the world. And they, had, they were trying to do their own auto tuner, which didn't work. Uh, so they contacted me and I sold a patent to them and I helped them to get it to work. And they made a very nice auto tuner out of this. And then Fisher was bought by Emerson. So the big users of the auto tuner right now is SAT Control, Emerson, and ABB. There are quite a few systems around. Then here's another thing. You know, this is a picture of the whole paper mill that uh, I was working on. And when we did the paper mill project, we, uh, the instructions from IBM was squeeze as much as you can into the computer. So we did process control, but we also did production planning. Uh, we did production planning for the whole mill. And um, uh, this job was later on continued. So typically you have 25 production units, you have 38 buffer tanks, 250 streams, 250 measurements, and 250 variables. And then uh, what you do is that you measure all the variables and then you do state estimation. Uh, and then you optimize performance and then what you typically do is that when you have optimized you don't introduce this um, automatically. There's typically a production meeting for example you start at Monday with a production meeting there's another one on Wednesday. And then you present this, uh, how, what the optimal production schedule is going to be to the operations. And then somebody says, well, you know, we really cannot do this because this guy is really good. He's on leave. He's sick right now. So we, 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 cannot, do, we cannot do all these sort of changes. So there is a sort of uh, discussion about how it's going to be run. And then they decide how they are going to do it. Uh, so you run the optimization, then you do simulation. So at this stage in here, you go into manual meeting before you really implement the changes in structure. You know, how much you're going to produce at what department, when you're going to switch something down, when you're going to switch something up. But this is something that's not been running for quite a while. And I think it's a way to move, you know, from the low level control to move it up to a higher level. And then some people are also moving control up to the enterprise level. You know, here you have the typical pro control shift. You, uh, you know, not big dimensions, uh, shifts in milliseconds. And then you go up to the manufacturing system. That's when it was the thing I was talking about. Uh, uh, and then you can c connect it to the business system up there. And there are, there are several companies who are doing, you know, this quite well. So, that was a little bit about the golden age. Now what about what's happening now? Uh, I think that um, we're entering a new area. There's increased use in traditional fields of control, but there are new emerging applications. And the drivers are network systems and also physical, biological, and social networks. Um, autonomy is coming into cars. You need adaptation, which we know a little bit. You need learning and cognition. Also, if you have a control system with about, say, 10 sensors and 10 actuators, we know pretty well how to do this. But when you have a camera, for example, it's a megapixel camera. That's millions of sensors. We can't use the same control structure. You can't, you can't take the, the, uh, the whole picture into the computer. You must do some kind of processing of the, the camera itself. So that's what I call sensor and actuator rich system. Another area that's popping up is to do safe design and reconfiguration. Now when you start to get much more automation coming into cars, when you make a change in the car system, you must have guarantees that whatever change you are, are going to go is going to work. And that's why you know, modeling and simulation are coming into a you know, much higher degree. So that you have, and we still are not at the stage where we can do provable safety design yet. Uh, and also I think we should re try to recover the holistic view. And I think it's possible to do this. So, so I think there are many interesting things happening. And here, just a couple of applications. For example, control of computer systems. You know, you have the server farms, and you are doing two things. There are tasks coming in. You have to allocate the tasks to compute, and you also have to save power. Because co power consumption for the, uh, for the computing system is one of the major costs. So you have to, you have to deal with those two things. Uh, yeah, there's a lot in military. I'm going to skip this a little bit. You know, autonomous vehicles, smart grids mobile telephones. Uh, and in mobile telephones, 
uh, there are a couple of important loops. There's a frequency controller. Uh, you are controlling temperature, voltage. Uh, there is also power and gain control. You know, one of the most important thing in the phones is to consume energy. So power and gain control is very important. And there, there's a lot of PEI, anti-wind-up, feed forward and gain scheduling being used. And now there's Graham has been doing a lot of work for, for Ericsson there. In that. Another strange thing is internet advertisement. Uh, I have a student, he was both my student in Sweden. And when I retired, and I was too old, so I retired at the turn of the century. I went to the United States to work. That was no problem. He was my student also in the United States. And he's now working in the advertisement industry for, for AOL. And what you do when you, when you advertise on the, you, you do an advertisement campaign, and then you send out the things, and then you see what's coming in, and you can see how effective the advertisement is, whether you should put more money into it, whether you should decrease the money. They're doing some interesting things out there. The challenges we have, uh, they are, systems are becoming more complex. We get uh, networks, we have lots, we have sensor and actuator resistance. We have to do safe design of embedded systems, I emphasize, autonomy is coming in, and we need to have good high level control principles, and also control is coming into physics and mathematics. I'm gonna ship this one. Uh, so, uh, for example, now if you, um, if you take a camera, and then you take, um, uh, what's called deep learning algorithms. You can train the camera to recognize cars, people, men and women, bicycles. So you, if you take a sensor like this with a learning system, you can think about this. It's a sensor that you can train to recognize what you're interested in. So, which, so that's important then when you are doing uh, uh, for example, when you're going to autonomous cars, you can recognize that here's a person, that's another person, and here's a car, and there you have a bicycle. That's very important for uh, autonomous driving. So autonomy is one of the big fields. We need adaptation and learning, cognition, safety, diagnosis, maintenance, and you also need to re reconfigure system. When you drive into a car, uh, car and fix it, you know, they're often changing software and there are changes, so that's an important one. And then you have classical fields of manufacturing process control. Here are a picture I got from, I was in Singapore a while ago, and Airbus is running partial delivery drones, and maybe one for flying taxis in Singapore, for example. Uh, I was this last, uh, a couple of, a week ago I was in Sydney, and I found in the newspaper the following. New chip act as brain for bicycles. The Chinese research have meant autonomous bicycle that can steer itself, avoid obstacles, and respond to voice commands thanks to a newly developed chip called Tianjik that acts as the brain of the bike. The chip combines computer science-based machine learning, brain-inspired approaches, and is believed by the research team to be the next step forward in the achievement of artificial general intelligence. So they coined a new term too. Not artificial intelligence, but artificial general intelligence. So, uh, this is something I believe a lot in, that you need to have a system perspective. So systems, the system perspective is becoming you know, more important than ever. I should also mention a little bit in physics. There are three Nobel Prizes in physics related to control. One is a Swedish engineer in 1912. I will tell you a little bit about this. Uh, the, the, he, they were doing particle accelerators. So Rubia was a physicist, and Van der Meer was a Dutch uh, engineer. And then you have Binning and Rohr, they were both physicists, and they invented um, uh, the quantum tunneling microscopes. And then in quantum and molecular systems, uh, that's another area. I'll tell you a little bit about the Nobel Prizes, because uh, after a number of years, they publish all the papers. So I will tell you about the first, first Nobel Prize in control. It was 1912. They had many strong candidates. Kameling Ons, Max Planck, Albert Einstein, Walter Nernst, Henri Poincaré. Very strong team. And um, the physics committee, they came up with, um, uh, was a professor from Uppsala, he proposed Kameling Ons. And then there was a discussion in the academy. And the academy also has uh, people from economy, uh, general class. So uh, some of the, uh, 
we had one guy who was CEO of Stora Kopparberg, is one of the old Swedish iron and steel companies. And he said like this, I don't think we should give it to Gamlingås. I think we should give it to Gustav Dahlén. Because he had invented regulators for the light, lighthouse. So, you know, he invented a regulator that you have in a lighthouse. So when it gets dark, switch on the light. And when the sun goes up, you switch it down. And he had four cylinders. Two were black and two were polished. And then a simple mechanism to do this. And he also invented a system to distribute gas out to the lighthouses. So there was a voting in the academy. And Jungbrus proposal won 37 to 28. So for once, you know, the engineers and the economists won over the physicists, which doesn't happen very often. But I think it's interesting. Uh, and in physics, you know, you have instruments in the giga scale. You have adaptive optics where you have a lens here which has lots and lots of small lenses in here. And then you try to eliminate the distortion you get when the, uh, the light waves go through the atmosphere. So you're essentially eliminating the disturbance. And then you have another one. It's the atomic force microscope. So what you have here, you have a surface you would like to investigate. Then you have a little cantilever. And because of um, atomic forces, this cantilever is attracted to the surface. If you do it right, this is actually following the surface itself. You can actually map out the surface on the atomic scale of this. So uh, there are some very interesting devices like this. And I have to, have to show you one, one example of this type that I've been involved with myself. When I was in Santa Barbara, I was working with the MEMS people. And um, what we have here is a mass that's hinged in here. And we are trying to control this mass extremely accurate to make an accelerometer out of it. And we control it in the following way. We have a little tip sitting here. And we have a voltage between these two things. And when they get close, you get tunneling. You get tunneling current going over here. So we are essentially controlling the tunneling current between these two things. And that makes it possible to control to a great degree of precision. Now you have two problems. You have to bring this mass close to the, you have to bring the tip close to the mass. You have to bring it in there, stop. And if you go too fast, you destroy the tip. And then when you come there, you have to do a control system. So um, we did this, and the dimension is something like this. You start about, um, uh, this is five micrometers. So you start about a little over about five, five micrometers away, and then you move in until you come into about the nanometer range. So, so it's like having you know, uh, a kilometer here, moving in until you come to, to one meter, and then you, uh, you start to control. Uh, so here is how our control system works. Here it's moving in, and I start to control, and that is what it's controlling. So in here, the signal here, we see it's noisy. And that is electronics noise in the electronics we have in the system. When it comes in here, we start to get tunneling. So then you start to see tunneling noise. And in here, you have much more noise. And that is the air molecules that are hitting this one in here. So here you see what's called Johnson-Nyquist noise. And up here, you see Johnson-Nyquist and uh, tunneling. And here you see Brownian motion. So I think that's a cool little experiment where you see three interesting noise sources. And, um, uh, I did this here with a bunch of people in the, uh, there's a lab run by Kimberly Turner uh, in Santa Barbara. And this was one of the leading students who did it. And uh, if you look to the dimensions, uh, we, are, we are regulating with a standard deviation that corresponds to about 0.2 angstrom. That's the standard deviation of it. And um, a silicon atom has a di diameter of about one angstrom. So uh, whatever it means, you know, if this would be the silicon atom, we are controlling with a variation of about this much, which I think is pretty interesting. Control is also coming up in biology. So here is from a book in biology that's called The Way Life Works. If anybody who has children or grandchildren, I strongly recommend it to read it to them. And the book has um, uh, s uh, seven chapters. One chapter is about feedback. And they say like this. Feedback is a central feature of life. Process of feedback governs how we grow, respond to stress and challenge, and regulate factors such as body temperature, blood pressure, and cholesterol level. The mechanisms operate at every level, from the interaction of proteins in cells to interaction of organs in complex ecologies. So feedback is all over biology. 
Incidentally, I've been requested to the physics department to give several control courses for them because they get PhD students for tour sources. They get the ones who come from engineering school. They have learned control. And then they get a bunch of students that have studied physics at the university. They don't know do any control. And they notice there's a significant difference how well they could operate the instrument. So I've been given several control courses to physicists of it. I haven't given any to biologists yet. Then we have economics. And these are two well-known economists. Uh, this is um, Krugman. And this is John Maynard Keynes. Uh, and uh, Krugman wrote now of the, the latest collapse in economy. Uh, he said like this. We have magneto trouble, said John Maynard Keynes at the start of the Great Depression. Most of the economic engine was in good shape, but the crucial component, the financial system, wasn't working. He also said, we have involved ourselves in a colossal muddle, having blundered in the control of a delicate machine, the working of which we do not understand. Both statements are as true now, that's what Krugman says, as they were when he wrote this article. So what he's saying is that the economists have an economic machine in here that they haven't got the faintest idea how it's working. So, what does it look like? Well, here's my view of it. Out here, you have the real world. The real world could, for example, be engineered. It could be a sugar mill. Uh, it could be some physical equipment. It could be biology. It could be an economy. Over here, you have mathematics. And then in here, we have three important subjects. We have computing, control, and communication. Uh, so, in order to do this well, we must sit in, sit, make sure that we have people who know some of this field extremely well, and then that they know enough about all these interfaces in here, so that they can work together. They must also be able to communicate. So, for example, there needs to be a good introductory course uh, that everybody takes. That's going to contain the essence of what it is. There needs to be a good control in communications. And of course, everybody has to take a bunch of courses in mathematics. And everybody needs to take a bit of physics in there, if one is going to work in this field. I'll give you one very good example. There is a communication bus for cars. That's called the CAN bus, C-A-N. And it's a beautiful little communication protocol. You know, it's compact and nice. But it has one disadvantage. It has variable time delay. And you know, delays are bad from a control point of view. Variable times delay are really bad. So if they're trying to control over a device which has variable <laughs> time delay, so if this guy who did design this had taken any good control, good course in control, he should know that time delays are bad, variable time delays are really bad. And that's the only thing you need to know. Then he would have done it differently. Uh, there are also a couple of barriers. There's a physics barrier. Because you know, we as control engineers, we like to do block diagrams. We like to work in order differential equations. Physicists, they work on mass, energy, and momentum balances. And I, I'm willing to claim that block diagrams, they do a lot of good. But they are not usable for serious physical modeling. And modeling for control, there's a modeling language called Modelica, which allows you to write the models very close to physics. So you write down the balance equation. And you do it by piece by piece. And then you connect the system. And then, uh, so you're working very close to physics, and then you use a lot of software to wipe out simulation code and optimization code. Uh, I should also say oh, something about, oh, went too fast. The computer science boundary. You know, you have control here, you have computer science sitting up there. And we talk about feedback and stability, ordered differential equations, partial differential equations, modular complexity and robustness. Over here, they talk about logic languages, uh, discrete times, finite state machines, form and method abstraction and architecture. And I think it's, it's necessary for the future engineers to know a bit of both. I'll tell you one example that we did with um, United Technology. Uh, it was electrical systems for aircrafts. And the Airbus 380 and the Boeing 787, they have thrown out a lot of the hydraulics and put in electrical motors instead. And then, you know, they need to have generate electricity. So they have two power stations on board. And then they have a lot of the voltages and things like that. They do a lot of switching. And the uh, 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 
One branch of United Technology has been doing electricity like this for a very long time and very successfully. Uh, so they had contracts with Boeing to do this kind of systems. And uh, it was very clear to the chief technical officer of the company that the system was getting too complex. So we were brought in to look at this and we persuaded them to use formal methods so that we can... The nice thing about this, they are discrete systems. And for discrete systems, we can use something called theory improvement to guarantee that, not, that nothing bad is going to happen. And there was a big resistance for the company when we started to do this. Well, the first meeting with Boeing, we tried to test, we found bad cases that Boeing hadn't discovered. And then, of course, uh, the lack was made. So I think it's tremendously important to be, for control engineers, to be aware of these methods. Unfortunately, these methods for discrete time systems, they don't carry over when we have controllers, you know, continuous time systems. So, so this thing doesn't carry over to that. So we cannot use the same technique to guarantee safe performance of control systems. But that's at least one case where we can really do this well. And this is not indeed complicated. I should also mention computing. You know, when I went to engineering school, there was one computer in all of Sweden. One. one. And if you worked for the military, you had access to that, which was great. So that's why you worked for military. So here is even earlier, Vannevar Bush at MIT. He was an electrical engineer working on power system. He said, engineering can progress no faster than the mathematical analysis in which it's based. Formal mathematics is frequently in inadequate for numerous problems. A mechanical solution offers the most process. And then he built a mechanical differential analyzer that could solve about six or eight differential equations. You program it, you know, with a monkey wrench. And when I worked for IBM Research, uh, I was in the math department for, for a year. And then my boss was Hermann Goldstein, 1960. The staff meeting said like this. When things change by two orders of magnitude, it is not evolution, it is revolution. And then you couple this with Moore's law, that number of transistors per square inch, they double each 18 months. It means that you have a revolution every 10 years. It's, it's leveling off right now, but for a long time in computers, you had a revolution every 10 years. And that's why you have to, we have to buy laptops so often. Uh, unfortunately, you know, a factor of 100 improvement is a tremendous improvement, but it hasn't contribute to engineering productivity by any means in the same amount. So we have not been able to capitalize on the computational advances to make our engineers more productive. We certainly have not made them 10 times more productive, maybe three or five in years. So that is something we have to watch for. So it's a strong potential, but so far, you know, uh, it has not delivered in terms of productivity. And then I say something about modeling and simulation. That's also taken from this study by the National Academy of Engineering. They say, there will be growth in areas of simulation and modeling around the creation of new engineering structures. Computer-based design build engineering become, will become the norm for most product design, accelerating cre creation of complex structures for which multiple subsystems combine to form a Some people call this model-based engineering. So, the, the Academy of Engineering in the U.S. is convinced that modern-based engineering is certainly going here to come. I'll give you one nice example of this. This is done by my uh, former graduate students. It has to do with climate control of cars. Uh, and what they did is that they persuaded Audi, BMW, Daimler, Ford, Volvo, and VW, and their suppliers of pieces of equipment for comfort control. You know, it's compressors, it's heat exchangers, and pumps and stuff like this. And what the suppliers do, they supply a piece of hardware and then a validated model can model. <coughs> and then what they do at uh, BMW, uh, then they configure a comfort system for a car. And then they simulate the whole system. And then they run the standard European drive cycles. They analyze what's the comfort and what's the, uh, what's the fuel consumption that it requires. And then they judge, is it worthwhile? Should we buy this? Is it better performance or not? And there was a bit of hesitation from the suppliers to provide the models. And therefore, they introduced encryptation. So they're encrypting the models. You can run the models, you can manipulate, you can do things with them, but it's extremely hard to figure out precisely what's going on. Uh, so I think that's a very nice example of modern-based, specific example of model-based engineering. So what do we have uh, those? I think we have a number of interesting challenges. Number one is education. 
We have to educate the future engineers and scientists. We have to educate physicists and biologists. And I call this the dilemma of emerging fields. You know, in emerging fields like control, you get new stuff coming in all the time. And it's, we really have to sort out what are really the fundamentals and what is the sort of flimsy things on the top. Yeah. And for example, mathematics is a very nice, you know, mathematics is, you know, very, very much wider than control. But mathematicians have been doing a great job of doing that. Uh, physicists also have been doing you know, good ways. But in control, we have not done this yet. And also, we should exploit advancing computing. This was an advantage they didn't have when they developed mathematics. So what you need to know, we need to have people who are very good at one area, they have broad knowledge of neighboring fields, and they have the ability to communi communicate and work in teams. So, now it's time to run out. So, I gave you a little introduction, talking about the magic of feedback. You can reduce disturbances, you can make good systems out of bad components, you can stabilize and shape behavior. I told how the field emerged, I spoke about the golden age, and I said, maybe there's a new area coming right now, We're in particular with the um, um, distributed communication system. So then here's the summary. I think control is a very vital and dynamic field. It was, if I was young, I would still go into it. Network and embedded systems are coming as something new. We need to do autonomy and safety. We have a big educational challenge. And if we compare, continue to take care of the foundation as we have done and develop the holistic view, I think the field is going to stay in a great shape. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll be very happy to answer questions of any type. Or... Uh, excellent talk. Um, yes. I'll try to answer your question. Uh, if I'm going to teach the minimum control, I'm going to say, this is a typical control. Say, here we have a process. And the process has an imp input here that I can influence the control variable. It has two disturbances coming. This one is something that drives the process away from where we would like it to be. If you have a car, when you go uphill or downhill, for example. And here, you have measurement noise. That is ob obscuring information you get from the sensor in here. So you have here, what well, I call this load disturbance, and there you have measurement noise. And then the controller, it has a feed-forward block and a feedback loop, F and C. So you take this reference value here, you put it to, through this one, and then you take the measured signal and put it to this feedback loop. So there is, there, you see, they have several ingredients. You have the process, you have the controller, you, you have the load disturbances, and you have the measurement noise. And you, the process variable should follow this Y in here. So that's how I would start. And then if you look to this, uh, you say that, the controller should reduce the effect of load disturbances. We should not inject too much measurement noise. Recall, you know, the, the, um, what I said about the magic of feedback. We should make the closed loop insensitive to variations in the process, and we should make the output follow command signals. And the interesting thing is that the nice thing about this configuration is that I can choose the controller to fix the first three things. And then I arrange it to follow the command signals afterwards. So I choose this one to eliminate this one, make sure I'm not feeding too much of this, so that I'm insensitive to process variations. And then I choose this one afterwards to make sure that I follow command signals. And then, if you look to this, uh, incidentally, when I taught in Santa Barbara for mechanical engineers, uh, for the first time. I was sitting in summer figuring what I should do in control. And they were using about three hours to introduce Laplace transforms. Okay? And they did a very bad job of it because in three hours you can't do it right. So I do control without introducing Laplace transforms. I introduce transfer functions. So then you know you can, and you can do this well in about two hours. So then I say one hour. But in, in here you ask what are the relations? Will you have one, two, three inputs. The reference value, the load disturbance, the measurement noise. And you have a couple of signals you're interested. You're certainly interested in the output Y. You're certainly interested in how the process variable behaves. And you're interested in the control signal, because the control signal cannot be too large. So now you have three interesting outputs, X, Y, and U. And then you have three inputs. And you write down what the transfer function is. And notice in here that if you're, not, if you're disregarding reference values, you only have four transfer functions. 
And we, we happen to call them the gang of four. You can also call them the sensitivity functions. Now, if you take into the reference values, you get two more. So I'm saying to the students, if you're going to look at a control, if you're going to buy a control system, you have to look at at least six responses. If you don't do this, you can be fooled. And um, there are, of course, some of them that are tremendously important in here. Uh, so, I, uh, so I say in here, to fully understand the system, it's necessary nice to look at all transfer functions. We call them the gang of four, which doesn't work well in China. Uh, uh, and then it's strongly misleading to only show, for example, the response to a reference value. Totally meaningless. Could be anything behind the system in here. And then I'll show you one of them. Here. If you don't have, if you have open loop, the output then is the noise, and then this load disturbance fed through this one. So it's N plus PD. When you close the feedback loop, it becomes 1 over 1 plus PC times N plus PD. So in other words, when you close the loop, it's the same as to take the open loop response and send it to this transfer function S in here. This is, you know, the sensitivity function. So this tells you if the gain of this is less than 1, you're doing well with feedback. If the gain of this is larger than 1, you're doing worse with feedback than with open loop. And then, of course, you can represent them in various ways. For example, if you plot the Bode plot of the sensitivity function, here's the gain. So you see, in here, you're reducing this disturbances, you're amplifying this, and the largest amplification you get is this one. In the Nyquist diagram, the same. All, this, all frequencies here, you're reducing, and in here, you're actually amplifying, and here's the worst amplification. This would be the sort of minimum of feedback I would do, and you can certainly do it in almost any sort of class. But that really brings up the fundamentals. Any other questions there? Thank you very much for your time. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.